Uh, good morning, early risers. I'm Julian. Uh, and it is today my honor to not only welcome them as they sit in the podium, but to just try to frame a little bit of what we heard, but also what's coming ahead of us. And so in the, in the last few days, we've been talking, of course, about art. We had the great conversation with Julian about Bloomsbury Group. And what we have not heard yet enough, and perhaps that is what is coming tomorrow with the film that will be portraying Bansky and Ai Weiwei, is also the notion of how artists are resisting. But I've been coming to think that perhaps, even if the Bloomsbury Group, as we were told yesterday, were more into an art form that was an art for art's sake, or, or we can characterize it that way, if it was not in the interests of the two wars, also a form of resistance in of itself. And if you come to think how art in Germany was being depicting the horrors of war and anticipating also, of course, Second World War, uh, but they had lived the war within their country or within their fields, within their cities. And England may be taking a resistance path and maybe, maybe it's also a form of resistance to turn your mind away from the depictions of horror, from the depiction of war. And maybe that is what the Bloomsbury Group were doing, another form of resistance. And I think today, when, and we'll talk perhaps that on Friday, when, when there's some criticisms about the Whitney Biennial or the Venice Biennial not being as engaged, as enraged as they should be, you know? And, and when you read those critics uh, saying, well, the times call for more enraged, Maybe this is the times in which actually the artists are, are taking the opposite stance. And I was recently in conversation with uh, a great artist, Nick Cave, who was being again celebrated at Anderson Ranch. And he says that he's in this particular times and after developing a whole body of work that were sound suits to cover his identity and to be able to express himself more, he's saying, today what I want is to openly express joy joy as a vehicle also to fight the times in which we're living. And so this, these are ideas and I think uh, themes that may percolate today as we continue. But today we have an extraordinary um, presentation. And just quick raise of hand, who has been at the Met and seen the newly installed uh, Islamic wing? And, mm -hmm. and we're so honored to have the mastermind behind that uh, wing. And so, yes. And to be in dialogue with her, we have Dr. Catherine Klinger, who is, as most of you know, a local hero. She is the Allen Stone Chair of the Visual Arts for the College of the Atlantic. And I think you're the founding chair of this position. The inaugural chair. The inaugural <laughs> chair. So there's always something very important to be the inaugural of something because you're a trailblazing. She came to McGill, from McGill University in Canada to take this position. And one also incredible feat is that she's both a practicing artist in her own right and someone who can talk about art, whether romanticism or 18th to the 20th century, a skill that is, I think, incredible because you can go and know what art is about, unlike someone like me that only talks about it. So <laughs> without further ado, <laughs> let's give the podium to them so that they can really have an engaged conversation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Julian. Julian. <clears throat> so Sheila, it's my role to introduce you. Okay. Um, so I'm going to do a formal introduction, um, and it's my great honor to do so. Uh, Sheila Camby is the curator in charge emerita of the Department of Islamic Art at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Um, she was appointed as Metropolitan's Patty Canby Birch Curator in charge of the Department of Islamic Art in 2009. Uh, prior to that appointment, she served as the Curator of Islamic Art and Antiquities at the British Museum um, beginning in 1991 um, in the Department of Asia, and then in 2006, I believe, um, in the Department of the Middle East. Uh, before returning to the United States, she organized the major spring 2009 exhibit, Shah Abbas, the remaking of Iran, at the um, British Museum, resulting in two pub publications. Uh, we don't have them here today, but we have her beautiful book on the 
uh, masterpieces of Islamic art in the Metropolitan uh, Museum. She received her MA and PhD from Harvard, and early on she was recognized for her scholarship and curatorial prowess. She held research and curatorial positions at the Brooklyn Museum, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, Fogg Art Museum, and the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Uh, curators are always educating others and, um, and themselves as well, and in that spirit, she served as a vis visiting lecturer at uh, SOAS, or the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London in 2004 and 5. Um, she has lectured and published extensively, and there's a long list of her book uh, presentations and publications. So I want you to join me in welcoming Sheila Candy to College of the Atlantic. Thank you. <laughs> it's always one of those awkward moments to, to read off uh, the accomplishments of someone who has accomplished so much. It's just uh, I'm really old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we're, we're all on that road. <laughs> so, um, our talk today is centered around the, uh, the galleries in the Metropolitan uh, uh, Museum. And in 2001, they were uh, uh, reopened after a reinstallation that took uh, eight years. Uh, the collection itself, the permanent co collection, I understand is comprised of uh, t approximately 12,000? No, it's actually, we registered more things, so it's now 15,000. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so it's um, less than 10% can be shown in the galleries at yeah. any one uh, uh, time. And um, what was interesting, of course, uh, during this period of time, and I remember, we all, I'm sure, remember um, well the, um, the Arab uh, Spring of 2011, and Shirin Nezshat, who was invited by the New York Times to contribute um, four pieces based on the four uh, uh, seasons, so in March, September, December, uh, and I think I left out uh, June. Uh, she uh, submitted really moving and quite beautiful pieces uh, addressing uh, what was happening in Tunisia, Bahrain, uh, Iran and uh, Egypt, the most um, obvious um, to Americans. And um, in that light, when the galleries did reopen, it was during a rather charged time, and it brought the world's attention to the work and the artwork uh, found within uh, these collections. So we've been talking a lot over the last few uh, uh, days about different things, about collaboration, which it took a, quite a bit of collaboration to accomplish mm. those 15 galleries. Uh, and we also talked a little bit last night about um, the imagination. And we're gonna s start off, I have a question for you, because we all know <laughs> the imagination <coughs> is often framed as being something super positive, that everything is just a font, and everything that comes out is super positive. But over um, the past years, particularly since 2001, um, the imagination in uh, some Americans and across the world has conjured, um, in some cases, more harm. Um, people imagine things about other people and uh, where they've come from, what their purpose or function on the face of the earth is, and uh, perhaps uh, inaccurately, uh, and so <coughs> I understand that at one point uh, you were in the galleries and had a guest, and we're going to start off talking about how the galleries helped to change one man's mind. Okay, so um, I'm going to just go to the first slide, which is the introductory gallery to the 15 galleries uh, that comprise galleries of the art of the Arab lands, Iran, Turkey. Central Asia and later South Asia at the Met. Um, you can tell we gave them regional names. And um, I'll explain. In the beginning, when the galleries opened, we had lots of uh, visitors, but lots of VIP visitors. We were asked to give tours to various people. So I was asked if I would please take uh, an executive uh, from one of the major conservative news 
organizations around. I said, yes, of course. <laughs> and so I was taking this man uh, through the galleries and we got to the one after this and I was just saying, here's a textile. It was uh, woven by um, cots in Egypt. There's a whole transitional period because once um, the uh, Muslims came and basically conquered Egypt, they continued to employ these people. Well, when I said the word Copts, he was off and running. Oh, what they're doing to the Copts in Egypt. I'm saying, well, this is the seventh century. <laughs> well, oh, you know, what they're doing. And I thought, oh boy, this is gonna be a <laughs> long tour. <laughs> Everything we look at, oh boy. But anyway, um, however, <laughs> we progressed and we moved to uh, the next gallery or the one after that. And um, actually, suddenly, his tone changed. And it changed when he started looking at these pieces of pottery and ceramics with these beautiful uh, turquoise glaze. So in the case in the middle in this um, gallery of Iranian and Central Asian material, he really started focusing in on these things. And I thought, oh, OK. So maybe this man is not just one dimensional and everything is not seen through the filter of what happened yesterday and what he heard on his, his stations <laughs> um, <laughs> yesterday. And uh, then he actually said, and I'm sorry, because I don't even really remember his name. Um, uh, I, he, I can't remember whether he said he collects ceramics from other places with uh, turquoise glaze, but he really focused in on these pieces. And so on the left is a um, 12th or 13th century kind of stand uh, made in Iran. On the right is one from Raqqa in um, Syria. And well, maybe it was too early, of course, at that point for ISIS and the terrible things they've done in Raqqa, so we couldn't go there. No. It didn't matter. It was just that he was transfixed by these pieces and these objects and looking hard at them. And so that could get us into a whole conversation about how this, the use of this glaze travels from place to place, that many places, um, in many places, you will find these pots made um, and covered, decorated with these glazes. And Raqqa in Syria in the 12th and 13th century on the right, that was a, a great center of this production. So we moved on. We get into uh, the Timurid period, so the 15th century um, in Iran, uh, after Tamerlane, 14th, late 14th, early 15th century, you start finding more and more glazing of tiles and tile work and architectural elements. So on the left, you've got uh, this beautiful carved um, element from what would be called a muqarnas, the great honeycomb uh, decoration in domes. And then again, a, a, a plate using turquoise and black as uh, in contrast with one another. And I have to say, this completely changed my view of this man, but I also felt that art can transform people. Art can disarm them. And it was such a sort of a strong uh, kind of tour once we got into looking at these things. Uh, it changed my view as much as I felt it changed his. And so that was how the whole notion of can Islamic art change minds uh, came to me because I I've obviously, I've drunk that Kool-Aid. I am firmly <laughs> <laughs> of the opinion that yes, it can. So that's kind of where we were. And yes, the Arab Spring was in the background hovering around, but it also was not the only thing in this man's mind, mm -hmm. and um, that was what encouraged me, uh, because I, you know, he could have been, <laughs> he could have <laughs> been a jerk for uh, 45 <laughs> minutes, but he wasn't, and, and um, it was heartening. Uh, well, 
Well, those institutions, um, and we both, we realized at dinner the other night that there's a lot of people that have spent a fair amount of their lives in London <laughs> uh, participating uh, uh, this summer. Uh, but I spent a lot of time in the print room of the British uh, Museum, and there's a similarity between being in that space and being in the Metropolitan Museum, and that is that those spaces are occupied by the most diverse host of people from across the world um, uh, continuously. And um, oftentimes it, it, it feels as though that um, these places are assigned elite status when in some ways they are welcome places for the proletariat. Uh, for everybody. For everybody. So, when you when the galleries first opened and you uh, had an extensive amount of work working with all sorts of of people, which I'm sure you could talk about um, uh, quite a bit, but prior to that, uh, how many objects had been on display before the approximately is it 1,200? Yeah. Yep. So mm -hmm. 1,200. Uh, Works on paper and um, textiles are rotated mm -hmm. because they're light sensitive. So in the end, it ends up being more like 1,500 a year or more than that even. Um, but we had uh, put 60 objects on view in a one case uh, during the eight years that those galleries were closed and being renovated. And so it was a a kind of a selection of the best things from the collection, but not no carpets because they didn't fit and things mm -hmm. so with, within limits and no architecture uh, could be there either. And uh, we did a visitor survey based just on those 60 pieces because uh, there were a lot of questions I had. I, I was newer to the Met than some of my colleagues and I really wanted to understand who the audience was and uh, how they perceived uh, not just the works of art, but when they read a label, what did they see? What did they think about um, w objects that had been conserved? How much conservation did they want to see and know about? And how much did they, they think should be hidden? Um, and it was a very interesting thing because we learned about people's backgrounds as well or that their identities and found that uh, there was a great range. And some of the people, um, were designers or you know artists or came from that kind of uh, uh, place and they they really were looking at this art to get inspired in their practice. Mm -hmm. uh, others might have had a you know grandmother from Tunisia or something and so there was a some family connection. Others didn't have any of that at all and they were from all over the world of course I mean really and uh, so there were Americans, there were Europeans, there were Asians, there were people from the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera. And that was all really, really fascinating to me because then we realized that, you know, we have to speak to a completely diverse audience when we have our galleries, uh, open our galleries, and we also uh, want to present the best things in our collection but we also want to uh, reach people on a level with, with, their, with which they're familiar. So um, we have various rooms that um, have architectural, uh, either fragments, parts of buildings, or um, larger whole rooms. And then also, like this one, uh, it's a room and a suite of three that uh, deal with the Ottoman uh, collections and it shows a ceiling actually that doesn't have anything to do with the Ottomans which came from Spain and the interesting thing about it is that yeah, I hope you can see it's got um, a geometric decoration painted wood uh, and it in fact has a kind of cornice that is um, that identifies it not as being from the period before 1492 but after because it's kind of um, comes from a more Christian sort of setting so 
we figured out that the, the room itself, that, that ceiling itself, probably came from a building that was a 16th century building. And yet there was a continuation of this uh, Islamic type of decoration on the ceiling. Um, then around the walls and in the center are uh, carpets, major carpets from all over the Ottoman world. And the one in the center is named after the owner, Simonetti. Um, the Simonetti carpet actually was made in Egypt. And so the reason I wanted to put this slide up and then the one I'll show in a minute is that, of course, we all have carpets. We can relate to this. Most people in most from most places in the world, right here, you've got a Turkish <laughs> carpet. Uh, it's still very much prevalent in the lives and homes of people. Uh, and so, interestingly, this room, it looks darker than it is, but it's pretty dark. And, um, well, I just have to say this. Starting with my own husband going on, this was a favorite room of many, many men. It's a man cave. <laughs> 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 we figured that out. Uh, oh, after the fact, of course. <laughs> and um, so that was the kind of thing we learned. <laughs> and I was as embarrassed because we I told her I felt as though I had entered a grotto when I went. We were we hadn't met each other really in person yet. We were <laughs> talking on the phone and I said, oh, the carpet gallery, I love the carpet gallery. I always feel as though I'm crawling into a grotto. And she started laughing. <laughs> <on the> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that's a kind of thing. And of course, the designer, I mean, the, who designed it? I should have known him. <laughs> he, he liked it a lot. <laughs> he, he'd done that. But anyway, and then the next room I want to show is the uh, Damascus room. It's an early 18th century room from a, uh, what would have been a large house in Damascus. Um, as you can see, it's got painted wood decoration, um, and it would have had seating around for, you know, receptions and things like that. Well, here again, this is a, a familiar uh, kind of uh, thing in people's houses. We, all, we have living rooms we invite our guests into. Um, and what was fascinating is that th right after the opening of the, uh, these galleries, there was a line of people. People were queuing up to see, to look at this. Uh, and it remains extremely popular. And of course, we're talking against a historical present current affairs backdrop of ISIS and the destruction of Aleppo and the destruction of houses like this uh, that, that, that would have held rooms in this. So it becomes more valuable to us that we are able to show this uh, and in, you know, relative uh, peace and uh, quiet in the Metropolitan Museum. And um, yet, from a popularity point of view, it's very striking uh, to museum curators to see when we see people queuing up to, to see something like this. And this was within the larger context of all the galleries. This is one of the most popular ones and remains that way. Um, so. so those rooms, uh, uh, the galleries, were arranged in such a way, uh, f from my perspective and experience, uh, it felt as though I was entering into a multitude of landscapes, mm -hmm. that you arranged them in such a way that you weren't enclosed in, in one space, maybe the Damascus room, for instance, but, but you could always see outside almost a fenestration or a window into yeah. the next gallery, and yeah. that was by design, I take it. Yes. Um, what we had had before, we called them the Islamic galleries, and it, the... Uh, it had been organized more around a sort of central thread of taking the religion of Islam through. We felt that that really, that, I, that moment has passed and that the uh, societies uh, in which these, you know, works of art and rooms and architecture uh, were 
were made uh, are much more diverse th than that and always were. And mm -hmm. I mean, in certain areas, uh, you take um, the, the Near East, the Levant, you have huge Christian populations, you have Jewish populations, you have Muslim populations. And then you have other smaller um, religious uh, minorities uh, that we've heard about for good or for bad in recent times. I mean, the Yazidis. Mm -hmm. It's not that we know that many of the things we show might have been made or, or made by or for people like that, but they definitely are part of the society and have been for centuries. Uh, you move further east to Iran and India or South Asia, you have um, Zoroastrians. And I mean, the Parsis are Zoroastrians. They left Iran and went to India. <laughs> so, um, and in India, I mean, in Iran, in medieval times, the Zoroastrians were still making art and uh, the, their, the symbolism and, and uh, imagery of their works of art figure in, um, in the, in the things that are in our galleries. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to go into a more geographic um, approach, though it's still chronological, but that, that was the way we approached it and that's why we wanted to uh, create a bit of a local uh, feeling uh, in the different rooms mm -hmm. by having vistas and things like that so you know you're walking from I don't know, Iran into Turkey or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, y one does get that sense, and especially during this sort of fraught age of global displacement. I, I shared with you, I just visited the Phillips uh, collection uh, last week or the week before. I lost track of time um, and saw their Warmth of Other Suns exhibition, and I was reminded, because it was, it was historical as well as contemporary work, that... Um, people have moved for a long time. They haven't always been made mm. to move. And um, the fact that, in a sense, the collection is shown in um, a broader light, um, in a sense more secular um, in orientation. At times, uh, you don't dismiss, obviously, um, faith um, and the work of faith within these pieces. But, but um, it, it, it really did feel um, as I said, just from my experience, uh, as I was moving through there, every time I go back, it's like revisiting um, the uh, really dear and wo wonder-filled uh, space. And these traditions are still alive. Yeah. Well, so in um, last year, uh, well, anyway, when Trump announced his uh, Muslim travel ban, uh, we felt we needed to speak out and in our way. Uh, and so we decided to have pop-up talks. The Ancient Near East Department and our department got together and we would have pop-up talks about works of art from the regions uh, where the people could not come from uh, to the United States. And uh, we would try to, oh, here, I just want to show some more carpets because, oh, please. you know, <laughs> 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 they're wonderful. <laughs> and also, uh, that is something that we all, we may not all have, you know, a 16th century uh, Persian hunting carpet on our, uh, uh, our living room floor, but, um, you know, I just wanted to show that this is such a strong tradition that it lives today and um, lest we all think that, oh no, we don't have anything to do with Iran. Well, folks, we do. <laughs> and we enjoy those things w in whatever way. And I've been in houses of people this week uh, that I hadn't been in before. And I have, of course, always, I'm always looking to see <laughs> what's, what's on their walls and what's on their floors because how can I not? I'm a museum curator. Uh, but I have seen a plenty of, uh, of uh, lovely uh, oriental carpets in, in people's homes here, even. Um, but I just wanted to say, okay, so the travel ban, which just seemed like something quite idiotic. And um, <laughs> on the screen, I'm showing two uh, works from the Metz collection. On the left is a late 13th century astrolabe made by the ruler of Yemen at that time, the Rasulid ruler, uh, Al-Ashraf 
is, was an astronomer. And he had not only written an astronomical uh, treatise, but he also made and designed astrolabes. Astrolabes are scientific devices used for uh, telling where you are by uh, navigation, celestial navigation. They, uh, for Muslims, are very useful because they tell you the time uh, uh, and the time of prayer. Um, they also give you the, the direction of Mecca. You can determine that so you know where to point yourself when you're praying. Um, and essentially, they were a medieval GPS device. Um, <laughs> and very uh, sophisticated because they have these, uh, these round um, uh, disks that go in them that are changeable and depending on where you are, and so you can uh, figure out your direction uh, based on generally where you are. So these had um, four, four plates that, were, uh, that pertain to the Arabian Peninsula, which would make sense if you're a Yemeni and you're designing this. Um, so Yemen, of course, was one of the countries from which people were banned, and um, travelers to the U.S., and so we wanted to include an object from Yemen, which is highly sophisticated. It is not something that just comes out of the sand. <laughs> it comes out of the brain and the intellectual brain of, in fact, in this case, a ruler. Uh, so this is not some oriental potentate who is sitting on a throne in, in um, you know, uh, Sana'a or another city in Yemen, this is somebody who's actually figuring these things out and is pursuing a, a, his interest and uh, coming up with, of course, the calibration and recalibration of the stars is something that started out with Ptolemy and went right on. And so in the medieval and early period, um, particularly in the Arab and Iranian world, you found highly, highly sophisticated uh, mathematicians and astronomers who were constantly doing this. And one of them, of course, is Omar Khayyam, whom we know maybe from his poetry, but actually he was an astronomer working at the court of the um, Seljuk king in Isfahan um, in his lifetime, coming up with uh, a recalibration of the calendar, which actually is what gives the Persian New Year start, which is the 21st of March, um, and they're basing their months on um, what is like our astronomical character, uh, or astrological uh, uh, calendar, but the 21st of March um, is the first day of what, Pisces, Aries, mm. yes, Aries, Aries, and that's the first yes. day of the uh, uh, of Persian year. Um, on the right, we have an illustration of men making uh, uh, medication out of honey. So they're stirring the pot. It has honey and brine and other ingredients. Uh, it was to help uh, an upset stomach. Um, and you see that it's a two-story building. This is also, uh, this is from a manuscript that was uh, produced in 1224, but it's based on a text, uh, the Dead Materia Medica, that came from a, um, a Roman period, uh, the Dioscorides is the name of the, um, the writer, the author, uh, sort of pharmacopoeia. And so, it shows a pharmacy, actually, and you see on the upper uh, upper deck, you've got um, albarella, or, or you have containers that would have contained um, uh, sort of uh, different drugs and and things that would be used in a pharmacy, and then people there. Well, pharmacies actually in the 12th century were attached to hospitals, so it would have been a separate but um, attached uh, part of a hospital. Hospitals were not just um, for inpatients, they also had outpatient um, 
areas where people could come who had appointments essentially with the doctor. And so our notion of hospitals, the way we organize our hospitals, actually it's not all something new that we came up with. This is something that we have inherited from the Arabs and Persians and Indians uh, in the who were doing this in the medieval period. Now, obviously, our medicine is uh, <laughs> something <laughs> different, but again, even that, optics as we know it, uh, that comes from Al-Haytham, who was a medieval um, physician writing a whole treatise on optics. And it's all advanced, mm. but nonetheless, that's where we get these things from. So each of us had in our pop-up talks after the travel ban, we had 10 minutes to talk about one object. And I talked about this manuscript page. And I have to say, I had a really big group of people and they were really actually pretty interested. And it wasn't me, it was the work of art, and it was the fact that the history of something like this goes back to a period uh, when the Arabs and the Persians were extremely advanced in um, their scientific and mathematical uh, uh, discoveries and their approach, approaches. And I guess what I was trying to say is, lest we all think that, oh, uh, all those terrorists are somebody else and somebody else's problem and they come from some other uh, civilization or, not civ or uncivilized place uh, in the world, uh-uh. Everything that we know, we inherited. We don't just pull it out of the sky. And I'm no astronomer, and I really don't know anything about, you know, space shots and stuff like that. But I would say probably uh, there is a fair amount that our incredibly uh, advanced astronomers in, in NASA uh, have come up with that, again, ha has a background, has a history. That all comes out of somewhere. And there was this great uh, sort of emphasis on science. And in starting in the 8th century in Baghdad, when the, um, the Umayyads and Abbasids were translating every bit of scientific text they could get from Syriac, from, from uh, Latin, from Greek, and then also the Indian languages, into Arabic, and it's an old story, and you know, and yes, it went on, and then it, then those went to into European scientific history and were translated into uh, languages that uh, uh, European languages and whatever. But um, it's a chain, and so that I felt, and we felt in the museum, you know, hello, we need to push back. We need to remind people that the people who are suddenly being told they can't come to this country come from deep, deep traditions, intellectual traditions, artistic traditions that inform us. And it's not just in, um, we don't live in, in a bubble. We might, we actually might live in a bubble, but we shouldn't because <laughs> our inheritance is a, is a global inheritance. Uh, and those ideas are for all of us. And I, I was so touched by the people who came to listen and hear this because they weren't um, taking everything on face value. They were actually wanting to learn and wanting to position this whole part of the world differently. And they, I think, saw the museum as a kind of a neutral space where they could come and that we weren't going to get into, you know, questions of uh, who did what to whom yesterday. Um, we're maybe interested in many, many yesterdays ago, uh, but it's usually not uh, a, a, a question of, of um, 
destruction. It's a question of, of uh, production and inspiration and how certain things can still inspire us today that were made so long ago. So mm -hmm. that was what we were trying to say and it was a collective effort at the museum. It was a whole group of different curators and graduate fellows and people speaking to the public and really asking the public, well, what do you, what do you think? <laughs> what do you want to know and hear about and wh look at uh, with this thing and get out of it? So that I feel like we spend m the modern moment uh, in the 10 years, um, or at this point, it's not quite 10 years, it's almost, uh, since our galleries opened. A lot's happened in the world, but I mean, basically, we're trying to remind everybody that so much was produced in these places and uh, over a long span of time, 1,500 years, and it's important uh, to see them in their own historical context and not just pull it always up into the present moment. So even individuals that, like you mentioned earlier, that recognize something because they had a Tunisian grandmother or so on and so forth. We, we spoke um, briefly about the printmaker Zarina uh, yeah. uh, and how um, we both have an affection. An Indian Muslim. A, an Indian Muslim. Now most I definitely guess American as well. A American as well and um, still living and still producing, making beautiful works. And uh, she made a choice uh, to leave and um, she studied a while in Paris and, and her work was shown just outside uh, the, the main body of the 15 uh, galleries and it was an encounter that was incredible because you ha it was centered. It's actually the 15th gallery. It, the fi it is the 15th yeah, yeah, gallery. Yeah. Thank you for that correction because I was going mad trying to figure out <laughs> no, uh, because I had happened upon it and, um, and being a printmaker and all. It was, um, at, at first I just saw Stanley William Hader, Atelier 17, and, and then I saw Krishna Reddy's um, work, which yeah. is astoundingly um, beautiful and complex. And then the absolutely breathtaking, austere work. Um, and it wasn't just your galleries that decided to, to do that. I mean, the, mm -hmm. that department, you joined with um, prints and drawings yeah. in order to, to, to um, show that work. And, and she, uh, there's actually a, a, a piece that's still online, I think, where she speaks about calligraphy. And her calligraphy, of course, was Urdu. It wasn't Arabic. And, and she talks about how she learned uh, calligraphy, as most Muslim children did from the age of what is it, four years and four days? That's when you, wow. uh, she was very specific about it. Uh. And, and um, her work really reflected sort of a different reception of that long-lived tradition of working in wood and looking at architectural features. Uh, and uh, she had some three-dimensional works, some sculptural works that as well that some, I had a friend that was visiting with me at the time and said, oh my gosh, that's so abject. And I said, oh my God, it's so beautiful, the, the small um, sculptures that she did. Mm. Uh, but, but, y but it is, uh, your uh, collection extends what I'm getting at into the 21st century. Yeah, um, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a <laughs> kind of a fraught thing in the museum because we were collecting 20, well, we were collecting contemporary um, art uh, once we opened our galleries, but then our modern and contemporary department decided Mm -mm. <laughs> they are going to be doing that, not us. So we had mm -hmm. our moment uh, because the drawings and prints department does collect and continues to and uh, has a curator in that area. And mm -hmm. so that's how that show uh, came about. Of th that these um, South Asian artists who had studied with uh, Hater. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very nice way to, sh to combine works from both departments and to show uh, you know, his influence, I suppose, on, mm -hmm. on these artists and um, to, to also deal with this displacement of 
of being expatriates for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. um, and through the work of Zarina and uh, Krishna yeah. Reddy. Beautiful work. Yeah. So we wanted to make sure that we had your involvement as well. And uh, we have some microphones. And I've been prompted to alert you to the fact that we, of course, are streaming live. And we are archiving this. So uh, we want everyone to be able to hear your question. So if you could wait um, to initiate your asking uh, at the moment that you receive the microphone, that would be that would be really useful for us. There's one. Wesley. Wes. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you. This is fascinating. Uh, I had a question about the executive um, looking at the work. Um, what was your take? on whether or not it was just the fascination of a collector fascinated with very valuable objects and not necessarily somebody interested in the culture. Because I think that there's a lot of wanting to own parts of other cultures that are rare, that have value as a trophy and as something that defers status to the collector. And I was just wondering if you felt that he was drawn in by the incredible beauty and value of the object, or whether he the, it, it extended beyond to an appreciation of the culture and the people. Um, actually, what it was was color. And he really kept walking over to these turquoise glaze pieces. So I didn't. I didn't think that value had much to do with it. I really thought it was a, an aesthetic response and a response to a specific thing and type and color, really. And I appreciated the fact that, uh, I mean, he would make a beeline for these pieces, uh, not a beeline for those pieces. And it, he, I don't think he knew all that much about the specific history and uh, historical, art historical context of these things. It was that he, he just, his eyes drew him to them. And that was, I found very heartening because you can learn, you know, it's always there. It, the possibility to learn is always wide open. But, um, if you don't have the eyes, you know, you're not going to have the emotional response. And that was what it was. Or, or what Julian said the other day about, you know, you have to engage your soul and your mind, or you don't have to. But if you do, that's really what art can get at in, in ways that nothing else can. So, uh, no, no, I, I, I kind of... That was the thing that I felt disarmed him and both drew him in and uh, also kind of transformed, in my eyes, somebody I thought was going to be a negative person was a positive person. And that was the best thing. And I think that I can't, because I don't even remember if he was collecting, you know, uh, uh, turquoise glazed objects from some other part of the world or not, but it was that that was striking to me about him. Thank you. Um, very, very interesting. I appreciate all of this. Uh, could you speak to a little bit, could you address the inherent differences between Islamic architecture, uh, Islamic art, excuse me, I'm an architect, in that which grows from the Arabian Peninsula and expands outward, and that which occurs, and you mentioned Timarid, Tamerlane, and that which happens in another part of the world, they really do take two very different positions, especially with respect to imagery and so forth, and different things happen. A lot is borrowed, but there are differences. Could you speak to those two differences a bit? 
Yes, and I mean, I didn't actually show, for example, m much that um, uh, is calligraphic. But of course, Arabic calligraphy uh, is a source not only for um, information as writing, but it is also a, a source of decoration and was um, uh, kind of elaborated on in myriad ways in, in the Arabic speaking world, in Iran, in India, in uh, Turkey, in all the regions and of course North Africa. Um, but that's the Arabic speaking world and into Spain. So that um, that's something I think is unique and becomes a decorative device that then is abstracted in the borders of carpets. I mean, I was just looking at this, <laughs> I don't know, you can see, but anyway, there are things that as ultimately are uh, forms, but they're derived ultimately from letters. And so that's something quite special that is to, to, I mean, special to the, um, this vast region where Islam is basically the dominant uh, religion. Um, geometric patterns and patterning are very popular throughout uh, architectural decoration, textile decoration, um, the um, and other kind of areas that are, you know, that are like bands of decoration in even in manuscripts, but in all different media, you'll find that. And in some places, uh, it's more popular than others. And so in uh, Morocco and uh, area, certain areas of North Africa, it's really prevalent and um, some other areas as well. Uh, figurative decoration is found in the secular world of um, Islam. It is not banned. It's simply not uh, found in religious contexts, so not in the religious architectural contract texts or in the, there's no decoration or uh, illustration to the Quran, for example, um, and other religious texts, but you see these figures uh, in the painting. I mean, they're all over the place. And again, it, it, that's part of you know, decoration and they're on textiles and things as well. And um, vegetal decoration of all sorts is all over the place. And um, it's popular from the, you know, from the Alhambra to the, to the uh, Taj Mahal, let's say. Um, so those are, the, those are considered the sort of main um, sources of the great myriad variety of uh, art and, and design, uh, decoration or ornament. And there might be some other things too, but I think that's really the, what they all stem from. It's on? Okay. Um, I was really uh, glad to hear that you did some visitor studies and you um, got a great diversity of visitors to the exhibition. And I wondered if they revealed um, any concrete changes in public opinion or other transformational uh, <coughs> moments that other visitors had. Um, the thing that struck me was that People said that they wanted a different narrative from what they encounter in the news every day, uh, which is mostly um, political, is often extremely negative, um, and you know, just tars whole nations with the same brush of negativity, and people wanted to come and learn and see something that was uh, that didn't have anything to do with that point of view. And um, so I think that's the sort of optimistic attitude <laughs> and that people come to museums for a uh, different kind of, um, they look at art for uh, a, a different experience that is hitting them somewhere else in their, in their emotional 
and intellectual makeup. And while they want to learn facts and all of that, there also is a desire for an experience that is, is visually uh, more complex. And that people want to learn history through different means. And they want to experience art as art. I guess, it, I don't know if that makes sense. But we learned that from what people said in their surveys as well as you know you can just look at people <laughs> spy on them when they're walking around the galleries and see what they do uh, and that shows what impresses them and the thing with the damascus room was that in the beginning they were lined up and something else i would say within 14 months we'd had a million visitors to these galleries <coughs> So the word had gotten out, but also it shows me that people were not deterred by something they thought was going, it was going to be, you know, oh, something those terrible people made. I mean, they weren't thinking that way at all. They were curious and wanted to come and, and learn for themselves and see for themselves. I mean, curious and independent-minded as well, I guess, is the thing. So... Julian, I think you. Um, Sheila, uh, I wonder if I could ask you uh, to make a generalization about the field you command. Uh, I was uh, heard this t title, Can Islamic Art Change Minds? And it made me think of the way that if in the V&A or the uh, Met I go from the European rooms to the Islamic rooms, my mind is changed by the, the temper of the art, mm -hmm. by the way that a European tradition in which some of the high points are Michelangelo or Rembrandt or Goya or Picasso uh, is a, tra a, a tradition that stirs, agonizes, uh, involves me because it's centered on the human body and the world in relation to the human body. Uh, I go from that to uh, the Islamic rooms and the, the first word that comes to me is beauty because mm -hmm. you are opened out into a contemplation of the cosmos that is in which the human body is only a very, very small part and um, it's a wonderful re relaxation. Is this a kind of crass essentialization mm -hmm. of your uh, of the Islamic rooms, or do you think that that uh, there is a particular way in which Islamic art changes minds? Um, I think, of course, in a museum, you don't experience quite what you do if you go to uh, uh, you go to Cairo or you go to Isfahan or you go to um, Rabat, and you can walk into buildings and you can experience the architecture and the amazing kind of meditative feeling that many buildings inspire, I mean great buildings inspire, both because of their spaces, and their domes, and because of their decoration, which even if it's simply bricks and it, they're not glazed or anything, the, the <laughs> the design and way the bricks are, are put together <laughs> um, it m gives one this sense of, of greatness and of light and mass and the relationship of light to form. In, a, in the museum collection, of course, there are lots of what people would call decorative arts maybe here, um, but again, the forms are pure. And even you have a round bowl and in the beginning, and if I, I'm sorry, I'm gonna do the terrible thing of <laughs> flicking back to the first gallery and going backwards on these slides. Oops, that doesn't work. Wait, I'm upside down. Um, that bowl in the center of that room now, that is such a prime example of how you take the simple, simple
simplest letter forms in black on a round wall of a, of a bowl. And it is so abstract to our eye, and yet there's rhythm and beauty, and it is something made in the 10th century that speaks to people today, and you don't have to know what it says, you just see the forms, and that is something that hits you <laughs> in a place that is, um, makes you want to stop and look. And then you feel something. And I think that we have that, we really uh, tried to achieve that with the works that are on view, which is not to say that we didn't want to choose the most important works, but the way we wanted to show them was to evoke uh, a deeper feeling from people than just simply passing through or simply saying, oh yes, oh, that's a crucifixion. Oh yes, well, there's Christ pen on the cross and blah. Or yes, oh, that's a crucifixion and oh, I mean, the impasto and the paint and the color is just amazing. Because of course, we don't have those. That The art forms are different. And it's to evoke a different um, recognition of uh, why why you feel something when you stand in front of these and and it's quite a different set of of imagery and different set of forms and of course it's also different uh, civilizations that are perhaps not familiar to everybody so it's important to draw people in by what they see no matter whether they know anything about it or not it, to begin with and you go from there. And does that answer it? Because I think the thing about it is you walk into the National Gallery here or in Washington, I mean here, meaning in Washington or in London, and the iconography of most of the paintings is something you recognize because it's, a, it's a what you've grown up with or you, you've studied it um, or you simply know. And the iconography here is not so easy to, uh, it's not the first thing you get. Or the technique also is more complicated. And so that there has to be a s immediate, you know, hitting you in between the eyes, the work of art, no matter what your understanding is in the beginning. And then you come, you read the label, and then you know it all. <laughs> so we have time for one more question, and we have someone over here who's had her hand up from the start. Uh, Sheila, I, I'm wondering um, a little bit about the process of uh, creating an exhibit like this partly from the politics of the Metropolitan Museum in that do you say, well, we have so many objects that they would look great in 15 rooms. I'm sure you don't do that, but are you borrowing space from existing uh, exhibits? Are you uh, doing this by committee? Are you um, choosing by committee? Um, how do you set up when you have an idea of refurbishing galleries like this, what is the process that takes place? Ah, well, it was a very lengthy process. I'll just talk, say at first, the, the physical space, the galleries were closed in 2003 because the Greek and Roman galleries on the floor below uh, were being completely renovated and there was too much vibration and dust uh, to for the works on of art above them to be safe. So they had to be, everything had to be taken out and it was a good moment then to start the conversation about, well, what are these galleries going to have and do, et cetera. And um, the space, the Islamic galleries had been more or less in the same place before uh, they were closed, but the, there, were, there was an opportunity to move offices that had been at the back away so that we could achieve a, a, a traffic pattern going around an atrium 
that was below. And before that, you, there, you couldn't walk all the way around, which was sort of tedious because you'd have to go walk here and then come back. And uh, you, know, you couldn't then have a good kind of flow. So we gained about 4,000 square feet uh, in doing that. We were able then to walk all the way around and make a different um, hmm, kind of type of uh, flow and, and organization in terms of um, going by uh, geography. Now, the collection is about 50 or more percent Iranian. And that is simply just a historical accident and just the taste of the times in the early 20th century. And also because the museum um, had an excavation, so we brought a lot of things back from Iran. Um, and so we had to accommodate that. And the idea of what was to be shown really is based on um, what the art historically most important objects are. And I think that that comes from, again, a uh, hundred and some 25 years, uh, it's really 150 years now, of, of publication and, you know, uh, kind of agreement between art historians about the, what, the, what the historical and art historical and aesthetic importance of of the objects that we show, um, what those things are. Uh, there were meetings and meetings and meetings and meetings <laughs> and more meetings. And some of those meetings in the beginning were meetings uh, that brought people in, the professors and other uh, art historians and collectors and people from elsewhere together to talk about. Well, okay, how are we going to do this? Is it going to be uh, you know, all about just the religion? Is it just going to be about based on one s single idea? Are we going to take into account that other parts of the Met are, um, are uh, geographic? You know, there's the American department, there's the Africa, Oceania, and um, you know, basically Americas before uh, the colonies uh, department. There's the European paintings department. So essentially, it was it was consistent with the rest of the Met to go with a geographic title. Everybody complained that oh well, it's so long and you have so many words and it's so much more snappy to say Islamic. But uh, the, the we held our uh, ground and decided no, we're going to do it this way because Islam is. <laughs> All over Southeast Asia is in uh, sub-Saharan Africa is actually all over the world, and you can't uh, say Islamic and then not show the art of Southeast Asia or those regions that are uh, not covered. So at least we're being honest and saying this is what it is, and this does not include certain things. Um, it. Uh, the great thing I found when I came from the British Museum to the Met, and the, everything was in sort of mid, you know, was in the middle of the process or a little bit towards the end, was that we did have all these meetings. And so we met um, with the buildings department and the, um, you know, I, sort of people in charge of shops and people in charge of this, that, and the other thing that y y on a fairly regular basis, not to mention every week we met with the president of the museum and the, um, all the time we were meeting with conservators and um, the designer was around all the time and people from design and graphic design and yada, yada, um, on and on. And that actually really makes a huge difference because while the curatorial voice at that moment was being rec was really respected, and had to be the curators had to be the ones who kind of had the basic idea. All the other people made everything happen, and the teamwork there is fantastic. And the way 
the people who install things, I mean, these teams of this, you know, sort of seven foot giant who can hold some incredibly heavy thing for longer than you can believe uh, to install things, all that kind of stuff uh, works beautifully, but it works beautifully because there is so much communication. And so I was really, really impressed with that. And I had never worked in a museum where it worked as well as it does at the Met. So um, it's not, nothing's perfect, but having all these tedious meetings, in fact, it wasn't so tedious and that's the way it actually makes it happen and look seamless. And that's what you want. It's like going to the, pl the theater. What you want to see is the play. You don't want to know that back there, there's some guy that's up there on that rig that's you know doing everything really perfectly. You, you want to make it so it's what you see. And that's what's important. And all the stuff that's behind the scenes happens, but you know, it's, it's not the thing that you want to know when you're, in, you're visiting. You're visiting the museum. Oh, Sheila, thank you so much for this. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. With us this morning and helping us. <laughs> there is more coffee and there is more goodies and we have about 15, 20 minutes before Sam Sifton and Kat Collins come up. And I would just like to acknowledge the foghorn, right? Like kind of annoying, but at the same time, how lucky we are that it's 70 degrees here and the rest of the country is sweltering. So <laughs> see you back in about 15, 20 minutes. Okay, thank you. Did I? Did I?